as soon as I don't know. Whoops. Arr. Okay, so I see participants are joining. Great. Brendan, do you prefer commissioner or managing director? I know your official title is MD, but everyone calls you the commissioner. So you have a preference? <laughs> There's a, no, I, I prefer managing directors. If, right. whatever, whatever you want to go with, I'm cool. All right, okay. All right. <laughs> And Jacob, who do you work for? Who's your boss? Uh, I report into Brian Keegan, okay. who falls under Chris Brennan's team. So obviously we're very close with, with cool. CB, which I know you've gotten to know very closely. Yeah. And David Thomas is asking, can you hear me? David, we can see your chat, but we should not have to be. I don't think we're going to have any voice open. And, and I'll make that announcement when we get into the panel. So, But we can see your chat. Okay. Okay. And then, um, how do we uh, how do we start here? Uh, do uh, Mike? Do you want to start and let me introduce the center, or should I just start and introduce you here? Yeah. Why don't you introduce the center to get started, and then yeah. hand the baton off to me, and then we'll go from there. Okay. All yeah. right. Uh, are we ready? We are ready. We got about sixty six people in the in the. Uh, we, we can give it a minute or I think really you decide when, when you're ready to go. Mike, Mike what's the over under for, uh, for people that we saw? Uh, the reg was about 100 plus last night at about 5 p.m. Eastern, okay. which has been pretty we should have We should have made a bet on it, actually. We should have. Been, we it's <laughs> always yeah. more fun to bet on sports. We so, should have Yahoo Sports. Uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. We're, we're, we're of a different generation, I think. I don't know. All right, we're the meter's popping up. I say we hit 75 and we go. Bam. All right. Okay. All right. So um, I, I, I think we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Iklak Sidhu. I'm the um, director and chief scientist for the Satarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. I'd like to welcome everyone to this round table on basically uh, this Innovation X round table. It's basically on topics of innovation that matters today. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about fan engagement. What, and I will um, let Mike introduce our distinguished panel in, in just one moment here. Uh, one of the purposes, and this is, uh, to the whole audience and, and also to the panel, I'll say one of the purposes of uh, why we host the, the discussions is that it's a, also a little bit of an advisory board, like a, a mini advisory board back to the center. So um, we're, we're very interested in what's happening today in terms of uh, innovation, like there's a lot of change going on in the world. And so we'd like to learn these things um, and, and we're inviting you really for that purpose. Uh, but in order to give us this type of feedback, you also have to know just a little bit about the center so that we can uh, make use of the advice that you're going to give us. And for that, I just have one slide to uh, share with everyone. 
uh, including the panel here, and it explains what are the main activities of the center. So if I can make the slide up here in a reasonable amount of time. Now tell me, are you seeing Perfect. the, yeah. you're, you're seeing it correctly. Okay, cool. wonderful. Uh, that's technology here. We have to get it to work. So um, first of all, uh, welcome. This is the Sitarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology that we're hosting uh, today's uh, session, this round table. Um, our goal is to empower innovators to positively change the world. And we do that in really three major categories. So the center has been started since 2005. One thing that we do in the center is that we teach people the skills of being an entrepreneur or being an innovator. Uh, we have a lot of courses which are challenge based. So uh, we might say, let's have a challenge to develop a low cost medical device for um, a third world country or something like that. Um, they can be in all kinds of different areas. We've done sports related challenges before. So in this whole category of Berkeley Method of Entrepreneurship, there's challenge oriented classes. A second category is that we have Innovation X or X Labs. And these are in areas like data, in blockchain, sports tech, uh, um, telephone, like what's happening in the mobile industry and 5G. And they're all like very different ways for industry and academics to, to work together in um, kind of colliding and mixing concepts and developing technology and also developing ecosystem. Our third category is professional and global education. Uh, I highlighted in yellow examples. So we have an engineering leadership program. This has been taken by people traditionally at places like Apple, Google, Yahoo, Network Appliances, Samsung, Cisco, uh, all kinds of tech companies. Uh, this year in particular, because of COVID and the situation, our courses are online and we're, we're like constantly redeveloping them in a way so that um, they can be taken um, by people now who are even in other places. So all of that's going on. One last thing I'll say is our focus is always innovation that matters, what's practical, essential. Uh, we have a very large ecosystem, uh, 2,000 or so Berkeley students, uh, 15 global partner academic institutions, uh, 500 executives, so forth, many ventures, experts, all of that. So with that background, um, I'm really looking forward to understanding what's happening with fan engagement. Um, I, I think the, the panel is just an awesome panel. I really want to hear your thoughts. And I'm going to turn it over to Mike to, um, uh, to take us uh, to the actual content of the discussion. I'm here to listen. And also, uh, I might have a question or two uh, along the way, but it's to interpret all the things that you say and make them useful to what we're doing at Berkeley. So thanks. Mike, uh, Mike Grandendetti, um, please uh, take over. Great, thank you, Wicklock. And thanks to the Satarja Center for hosting this event. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am because I get to bring together two of my great passions in life, which is innovation and, and sports, especially basketball. And when I think about, as a kid growing up, how little technology was in the world of sports, right? We got baseball cards, okay? <laughs> We had Chuck Taylor Converse All-Stars. I mean, it was pretty basic stuff. And when you look at the world of sports today, and, and, and as I had the opportunity to prepare for this panel, the more I researched, the more blown away I am with what, what remarkably disruptive changes are happening in the world of sports. So we're gonna talk today with two members of the National Basketball Association, as well as Michael Proman, who spent four years, formative years in his career in the NBA before launching into a career as a sports tech entrepreneur and sports tech VC. Now, why the NBA? For those of you who uh, come to the Sartarja Center, obviously innovation is important to you. Fast Company named the NBA as the third most innovative organization on the planet. Now think about that for a second, okay? Many of you are watching us from Silicon Valley. And here we have a professional sports league headquartered in New York, but clearly doing something right. And what I've always seen is that they've been fearless in adopting pioneering 
early technologies for competitive advantage. And I think we're seeing that firsthand today as we see this tale of two cities between the NBA's remarkable success in the bubble with no COVID whatsoever. And, and all the news about the NBA is about the games, which is the way it's supposed to be. And the, and the news about a lot of the other leagues are about a lot of things that are a lot less interesting to us, like how many people are infected on these teams. So this is an organization that has really proven its mettle. Um, and, and as a result of that, I think we all have a lot to learn, not just professional sports, not just entertainment, but I think any organization that is trying to engage their customer base today digitally is someone who will benefit from the insight. So with that, I want to first welcome our amazing panelists. I want to welcome first Brendan Donahue. Brendan um, brings almost 20 years of tenure, both at the team level. He, he spent a number of years uh, associated with a number of different franchises, including the Milwaukee Bucks, uh, the then New Orleans now, uh, the, the New Orleans Hornets at the time, and he spent a lot of time in Atlanta as well. But maybe one of the most interesting roles that he plays, we're going to get into this very quickly, is he spent many years in what is called TEAMBO, Team Marketing and Business Operations, which is an internal consulting group which provides strategic services to the franchises. And there's an incredibly symbiotic relationship between TEAMBO and the group. Jacob, who works out of the league offices in New York City, who's been there about six years, formatively in his career, he was at ESPN and NFL, so he certainly is someone who's worked in the world of professional sports, both on the broadcast side as well as on the, on the league side. His boss's boss describes him as a rising star. His boss's boss is a, is a, a guy that I have tremendous respect for. Um, and he's really helping the league transition to engaging their fan base on a digital basis, specifically through retail-centric partnerships, okay? And then Michael Proman, who was there at the beginning when the NBA decided to go into China, it was him and one other person. So he has some very interesting experiences about how the NBA took on a continent that we all know very few Western companies have had success in. So we're going to tap into a little bit of that historical knowledge just to show how the NBA has built a global franchise. But a lot more of what we're going to do with Michael is we're going to talk about the sports tech trends that he sees from his vantage point, both as a VC investor, but also someone who heads up Sports Tech Tokyo. And I think all of us know just how advanced the Asian culture is around esports and gaming. So we're going to tap into Michael's knowledge about that. All right, great. So, and by the way, we are going to be taking questions through the chat and every, let's say 10 minutes or so, I'm going to pause and Jennifer, nice, who's not on screen right now, will be kind enough to push some questions my way and we'll try to get some of your questions answered as we go through this panel. And of course, for those of you who are interested in the sports lab, um, we would love to hear from you about potential collaboration going forward. So Brendan, commissioner, if I can. Managing Director, um, tell me a little bit about what Team Bo does. Obviously, it's got an incredible reputation in the world of professional sports, and many of its former uh, employees have gone on to run teams and leagues of their own. Yeah, so, so it's actually it's a group that started about in the late 90s, about 20, 25 years ago. Uh, you know, something that David Stern really believed in and Adam Silver has really doubled down on. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I mean... In the, in the vein of innovation, I think the NBA teams quickly bought into the notion that while they competed on the court, they actually were better off working and learning from each other off the court. Yeah. So Team, Team Bo is a group that, uh, you know, 40 plus folks that are on the road consulting with our teams, kind of finding best practices, and then in real time sharing what's working so that all the teams benefit from it. So it's, uh, I, I think, you know, initially there was some, probably some skepticism about sharing information or sharing data that you would expect, you know, in the, in the world of consulting in general. And right. I think now though teams, you know, now we, there's, you know, anywhere from six to eight, you know, league meetings on a yearly basis. And they've gotten very specific and granular across every kind of segment of, of, of the business, whether it's sponsorship, ticket sales, leadership, et cetera. Yeah. And one of the stories you share with me during our prep is, 
as we now start to talk about the 2K League, right? And again, the, the harmonious relations between the league and the, and the teams, I think is very important to understand because as you mentioned, right, the esports focus and the 2K League was really based on interaction between the teams and Teambo. And, and you talked a little bit about what they were seeing and how they brought that back to you. Can you share a little bit about that? Sure. So, so I mean, so no, no questions. So, I mean, the majority of our, our governors who uh, of NBA teams, they own arenas. And, and so many of them were, you know, were booking these, you know, League of Legends events. And all of a sudden they would sell out in 10 minutes. Yeah. And so they, and they would go and, and witness these firsthand. And they, they clearly saw that something special was going on here. And this might have been five or six years ago. And, and they quickly kind of came back to, you know, the Board of Governors meetings we, we host uh, with all of our teams. And they were sharing kind of what, you know, that we need to be in this space. And yeah. so that, that quickly matured into a conversation, you know, between the NBA and one of our best partners in, in, in Take Two or 2K. Yeah. And, and so uh, it quickly matured into, hey, we need to do this ourselves. And so the 2K League was born out of that. Okay. And, and here we are now. We're three years in. And, and I know that there's been so much talk about the bubble around the players, but clearly you also had to do quite a bit of shuffling around to keep the, your league moving. So can you talk a little bit about how you were able to do that and, and what were some of the challenges and, and how you worked your way through the COVID-19 impacts? Yeah, of, of course. As I, as I would say, kind of, again, in the vein of innovation, I mean, who would have known that COVID has been the mother of a ton of amazing innovation, including the fact that we're all talking on a Zoom call yeah, yeah. All, you know, ac across the world. Um, so I think, you know, we no longer could safely play in our studio in New York and travel players in and out that no longer was an option for us. So we quickly pivoted to, you know, creating a, a version of the game that could be played remotely. Um, and also create literally, we, we worked with an agency to create, um, a broadcast studio that was virtual and yeah. was pulling in 25 different studios across the country into one virtual studio enabling partners to kind of be embedded into that space. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, there's been a, a we're, we've been pivoting and innovating nonstop this season, but I will say it's been amazing for us because there's a lot of stuff that we wouldn't have done that will now carry forward for the future. And what would be the one thing that you were like just completely convinced that you're going to carry forward, that the lesson is so enduring that, you know, you might've never guessed you would have done it, but now it seems like it's such an obvious thing to do going forward. I think the virtual studio just opens up remote gameplay for us and allows us to, hey, we can host a games and we can host games in Europe, we can host games in China, in California, wherever, and I think we can pull that into one remote, uh, one virtual studio, and I think that's one that I think, why we won't we won't do it exclusively in the future because we believe in our live games in person, it'll be a part of a, a hybrid setup, I, I would imagine. Okay, great, and and thank you so much for that, Brent. So, Mike, let me ask you now. So here you are. You know, you're sitting in Asia, you're expecting the Tokyo Olympics to happen and, and looking at it as a, a very pivotal event. Of course, it's been postponed and there's still talk about will it actually happen or not. But from that vantage point, right, I think you shared a statistic that out of the 2.3 or 5 billion gamers on the planet, a very substantial part, 1.5 billion are out of Asia, right? So you've got this massive esports gaming world and there's a culture there. Right. So, and, and I know one of the cultures is it's an open innovation culture. Right? It's a culture of sharing and doing extension. So can you talk about how you've seen that gaming culture evolve in Asia and what we might expect globally as a result? Yeah, I think, you know, first off, thanks for having me here. This is fabulous. And, and certainly the folks at Berkeley for putting this together. Um, I, I think in general, right. I mean, it, it is a, a massive culture of gaming in, in Asia. And it's very much a microcosm of the entire world, as, as Brendan mentioned. Um, you look at some of the kind of beneficiaries of COVID or the tailwinds, and, and gaming's at the top of the list. Uh, there's no yeah. question. Um, you look today, right? I, I mean, look at the news of, of, of Epic um, yeah. with the investment. $17.3 billion valuation right now. Yeah. Okay, just to put that in perspective, DraftKings is 12. Yeah. Live Nation is 10. Yeah. Manchester United is two and a half. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So if I told you even six months ago, 12 months ago, 24 months ago, yeah, that would be when you look at, you know, publicly held companies in the sports space where Epic would be, nobody would have guessed that. Right. That's extraordinary. 
Yeah. So it, it, when you when you see figures like that, it, you know, it, it's just a reinforcement of what's going on and yeah. where the trend is going. And so when the MBA, I think, is is kind of a pioneer in technology and, and certainly has the foresight um, that that's better than a lot of the properties out there, yeah. sees the opportunity, they kind of go all in. And, right. and you're seeing that right now, obviously, everyone's trying to play catch up. Uh, but with respect to Asia, just kind of taking the conversation back there, you know, Esports gaming, people were doing it back in the 90s, right? Before it was even cool. Yeah. Um, and so you have this kind of legacy culture of gaming yeah. that arguably doesn't exist in other areas of the world. And you think about those kind of first generation gamers, right. um, you know, the, the, the folks that are my age, right, that are, that are 40, that were playing in 1993 when they were 13 or 15 or whatever that number is, right? And yeah. now they have kids of their own. Yeah. And so now it's just kind of almost reinventing itself. Right. Uh, and so that's where I think you see a lot of the surge right now is that you have now for the first time multiple generations yeah. um, under the same roof. And in some cases, um, you know, multiple, you know, two or three. Um, so that's really interesting. And then I would go one more step further, just kind of more broadly of saying we are still very much in the infancy. And I think Brendan and, and everybody else would agree that you know, 10, 20 years from now, we'll be looking back at this and being like, this is kind of like being in a gym in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1886, right? right? Yeah, yeah. That the reality <laughs> is, baskets, huh? yeah, well, from an investor <laughs> standpoint, that is what is driving so much capital into the space. Yeah. If I told you, you could buy in to the earliest days of the NBA or the earliest yeah. days of fill in the blank property, yeah. everybody would be, you know, kind of, you know, driving the price up. So yeah. You hope that there's not going to be a bubble. You hope that there, you know, things are, are happening responsibly. But all the trends you're seeing right now, and particularly around COVID, are, are only pushing in one direction. All right, that's great. And that leads to one last question for Brendan around 2K, and that's the vision. And, and I think to your point, Michael, right, for the first time we see a team from China that's not affiliated with, a, with an NBA uh, franchise up and running on the 2K league. But Brendan had shared a very interesting, very uh, – compelling vision for where this all goes. So, Brendan, can you talk a bit about that? Sure. So, so um, listen, while we fully expect all 30 of our NBA teams to be in the, the 2K League at some point, yeah. I think, uh, you know, we always had aspirations of this being a truly global league. And we took our first step towards that uh, this past fall when we announced that, you know, our newest franchise, the Gen G Tigers of Shanghai. And so, uh, Gen G has a great reputation in the broader world of esports, and, and I will say, you know, as we look to expand, we're specifically we're specifically looking to partner with organizations that can help us scale this. And so, Gen G brings a ton of they're kind of tip of the spear in terms of uh, player development and training in esports. They actually have the first ever esports school in Korea in Seoul, uh, and so, and so. Um, you know, they're going to actually, besides being a team in our league, they're also going to be kind of helping us identify players in China and across Asia. It's kind of part of the value they're bringing to the table. And so that's what we're going to continue to do. We envision being having a European division, having an APAC division, certainly a North American division. But yeah, we, we've, we envision having, the Shang, you know, the Genji Tigers of Shanghai playing Knicks gaming and well beyond that point. Wow. Very exciting. All right, so I'm going to shift a little bit. And if there are questions around 2K specifically, now would be a good time to put those in the chat and we'll curate those with Jennifer's help. So Jacob, I want to go to you if I can. So we've, we've seen this retail apocalypse. We've seen these many hundred-year-old brands, Brooks Brothers and Lord & Taylor as of yesterday or two days ago and Neiman Marcus and all of these predominant retail brands just vaporize. And here you are working in the world of retail and, and creating partnerships. And, and clearly the world has shifted, the tectonic plates have shifted. So what, what is going through your world right now? How are you reacting and adjusting to this profound shift? Yeah, I mean, we have a saying within our group that, you know, retail isn't dead, but bad retail is dead. And, you know, I'm not breaking any news here and you kind of alluded to beforehand that you know, the effect of COVID and what's that been um, in the brick and mortar retail, it, it, it's been devastating to put it frankly. And, yeah. you know, disposable income has dropped substantially, foot traffic is nearly non-existent. And you see, you know, a lot of stores closing every day and, and 
Yeah. Brands going, you know, bankrupt. So brick and mortar took a hit. But as Brendan kind of alluded to earlier, you know, when you have an obstacle like this, it usually breeds innovation. And yeah. what we're focused on is, okay, and the brands that we're trying to help brands with is, okay, what innovation is this now building up? Like, how are we now using this as an opportunity to then drive better parts of the business? So we've seen a lot of um, and positive stories around driving business e-commerce, direct to consumer, kind of yeah. support that business, um, omni-channel experiences and having that buy online and pick up in store. So there are stories to be told. Um, we think good retail will still be in existence and we support that business. But if you're not innovating and if you're not, you know, staying one step ahead, then you will fall back into the pack. All right. And I know that you have a, a partnership with Fanatics, right? So I'm assuming that's there's some some significant focus right now. In, yeah, in sure. So, yeah. So, I mean, Fanatics is our um, is the MBA's e-commerce provider. So they operate mbastore.com. They're also our um flagship store on Fifth Avenue, they operate that store as well. So we obviously work very, very closely with them on yeah. you know, improving and, and try to enhancing our, our online and e-commerce sales. And they've done a tremendous job and they've been a tremendous partner throughout this whole process. Um, so it's been, it's been fantastic working with them during a time like this, absolutely. All right, and I know, you know, certainly digital and social falls within your domain. And there's no question, you know, social commerce in China through WeChat and, and Ant and others is, is, has been so far ahead of anything that we've been able to do. Given that you have a, a tremendous franchise and you've had a lot to learn, what, what are you bringing back? What are some of the best practices you're bringing back around social commerce and, and e-commerce from other parts of the world that are ahead of us right now? Yeah, so I mean, if you think and look at that even from a broader lens, you know, structurally, the NBA has incredible advantage, advantages. The fact that we have offices yeah. around the entire world, right? We have offices in Asia, Canada, China, Europe, Latin America, and, and so forth. So the fact that we have people on the ground in those locations yeah. providing feedback and have the pulse of those you know, regions to then share what trends are, trends are emerging from those areas back to the US that we could then implement is tremendous value. So you mentioned WeChat beforehand, and you know one trend that we're seeing that's kind of budding here in the US is actually QR code technology. And while yeah. QR code technology is not necessarily something new, um, it actually, you know, given the fact that we've had updates to our phones, there's now an opportunity that the technology has now matched the fact that QR codes can now be implemented in a more seamless manner than it had beforehand. So, you know, if, if you're in China, if you're trying to add in a new okay. contact, you would actually scan someone's code. Whereas okay, actually, I'm going to take a question. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Jacob. I just, the, the voice is breaking up a little bit. So please continue. Oh, sorry. So now, so I'm just saying, yeah, QR codes is obviously very important, something that we continue to monitor and trend. And the other one I would just quickly mention is virtual influencers. The fact that we're now brands are starting to use CGI technology to, uh, and using those brands and, and virtual influencers to drive brand awareness is something that's slowly picking up steam here that people should you know, be aware of. All right, sounds good. I'm hoping I'm coming through because I'm having a little trouble. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, all right, great. So I have a question that came in through the chat and, and this is an eSports related question. I know we had a little bit of a discussion about this before. I think there may be a, a unique uh, company working on this, but the question in the chat is, how do you see metadata analytics for the eSports gamers as an opportunity on how to identify not just best players, but to look at their skills? So let me, let me start with that. That's, it's a pretty long two-part question. But I do know, you know, I think we heard about Home Legion specifically, right? As, as one way to identify this talent. So Michael or Brendan, either of you want to address this? I can start. Yeah. Mike, Mike certainly can jump in or cut me off. Um, I would say there's two different ways we kind of look at data very closely related to the game and the game engine. Um, so one is in player identification. So, uh, you know, when we had tryouts, for example, we, we have players trying out, we're not looking at points, rebounds, and assists. We're looking at how precise their, their shot release is and, you know, uh, how, if the, making sure their defensive efficiency is, you know, is, is at a high level. I mean, we're looking at like literally 60 different data points on every single player across every single game. Wow. Because you're trying to differentiate the elite from the elite, so it, it really it, it, that granularity in data is really important for differentiation. 
And then I would say the other point on, on the yeah. other, uh, the other big learning from metadata is the importance of us keeping the game fresh, because if you're not careful, you can have a lot of uh, copycat uh, play within the league and you can end, end up having a stale product. If you're not being, you know, if you're not being nimble and adjusting, you know, adjusting the game to force uh, or, you know, to force adaptation. And, and so I, I think that's a really important thing for us to make sure to keep our game um, fan friendly it's important to kind of you no know, to, to study what we're learning in the game engine. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm personally amazed by the, the the amount of data that's being acquired right now, uh, individual player data, just and then just more macro level trends that are being uh, evaluated. Uh, you alluded to a company. Um, I, I'm not going to actually be able to share the name of the company that we uh, formally invested in a few months ago. They haven't formally announced their A round yet. Um, but it is a company that is very similar uh, in scope and uh, to a, a company that the, the NBA took an equity stake in uh, last year called Home Court. Uh, obviously, Home Court is really more endemic in the basketball community, although they have branched into other sports more recently, in that they are a discovery and, and development tool for um, the global basketball community. I mean, uh, we know that it's a fragmented um, world uh, when it comes to uh, finding and, and identifying talent. Uh, I think the same holds true in, in esports as well. Um, there's a lot of undiscovered talent. There is talent that's so, kind of been discovered, but but needs a little bit of coaching, so to speak. Um, and so we feel within the esports space, this is a, a really attractive time uh, to 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 make an equity investment in this company and. I really hope it'll get announced here soon, so I can be a little bit more public about it. But uh, but it's a uh, but as I said, it, it, you know, you you're kind of throwing darts against a wall right now when it comes to investing in esports. I think over time there will be pockets um, similar to what's going on right now in sports tech, right? Where uh, I would say home and connected fitness technologies, um, betting, fantasy, those seem to be the ones that that are continuing to uh, see a, a, a massive acceleration while other aspects of the industry are, are kind of on pause. Um, so yeah, uh, stay tuned for more there. Exciting. All right. So let's, let's shift to partnerships. And there's one very important partnership that we're all benefiting from right now. And, and Jacob, I'm going to direct this to you, but anybody who wants to comment, and that is um, Microsoft and the NBA have created a level of fan engagement that's actually quite su surprisingly satisfying compared to other alternatives that I've seen on TV. Um, and so, you know, we, a lot of us either use Zoom or the equivalent Microsoft Teams, and now we've got Microsoft Teams having a together mode feature. Um, and you've got these massive 17-foot screens, you know, surrounding three of the four sides of the court. And the teams have their algorithm for who they tap to kind of come and cheer on their teams. But, Michael, if you can kind of describe a little bit about, you know, how that all, uh, that experience is created for everyone and, and what feedback you've been getting from, you know, the fans and from the league and from everyone else. You want Jacob to take that one? Uh... Oh, Jacob, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Jacob, I'm looking at you because you're, you're full screen right now. I'm looking at you and yes, Jacob. Yes. Sorry yeah. about that. Yes, Jacob. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as you said, the Microsoft Teams uh, virtual fan experience is an excellent example of how we're using technology, uh, leveraging our partnerships to connect with fans, to bring them closer, you know, to the NBA brand and family. And the truth of the matter is, out of the millions and millions of NBA fans around the world, the reality is that majority of our fans actually will never be able to attend a physical NBA game in person. So working with Microsoft to be able to simulate that in-game and in-arena experience, a huge leap forward that we've made and really opens the doors for many opportunities um, far beyond just the season. And I will add, not only are the teams being able to leverage um, kind of the screens that you mentioned beforehand, but our partners as well. And it's been a great opportunity yeah. to extend that olive uh, branch to our partners for them to engage in their consumers as well. So. I mean, when you talk about innovation and breeding during a time of a pandemic, I think this is, you know, example number one right up there in, in one of the best examples I've seen um, in terms of really, really capitalizing on a situation that has far beyond reaching ramifications beyond, you know, just the next couple of months here. So, so does this mean that you're already putting and together so your you, TikTok you strategy? <laughs> Sorry to cut you off there, Mike. Yeah, that's okay. 
I was just going to ask Jacob, are they already developing a TikTok strategy, um, you know, given the, the conversations that are in place with ByteDance and Microsoft? Well, we'll see if TikTok is still around. They guess in a little bit, yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. They're going to be but, part yeah. of the, the partnership family here soon. <laughs> yeah. But I think all conversations are on the table at this point. Hey, Mike, if, if, you, if you don't mind jumping in, if I jump in. Please. Just I think one important point, and I think Dr. Uh, Sidhu uh, mentioned this early on at the beginning. I think, I think what's gone on around the Microsoft Teams uh, use in Orlando is also speaks to kind of change leadership. And I, th and I yeah. think what Adam, Adam Silver said to all of us at the very beginning of this, um, when the pandemic started was, you know, those organizations that double down and invest during these tough times will come out yeah. flying ahead of the competition when, when you, know, in, in, you know, and I think that's exactly what I think has gone on. And yeah. so I, th I think, I think making sure you have the right setup for innovation for, and from a leadership perspective is so important. I love it. And you know, it's very funny, right? Because obviously in a very different world, there's a company called Cisco Systems. And Cisco is a company, John Chambers was the CEO of Cisco, and I have immense respect for him as a leader. And he always used these dips to double down on investment and to separate himself from the pack. It says everything about, again, the fearlessness I spoke to earlier, that you guys are willing to jump ahead of the pack because you already had a TikTok strategy. You were very early on TikTok, very early on Twitch, right? Very early on YouTube. And you know, and it just says everything about the mindset, right? Innovation is as much about mindset and culture as it is. So, you know, and you're creating more distance, right? I mean, the, you know, someone described this as a tale of two cities. It's exactly what it is. So let me, let me talk about another uh, capability that may or may not be ready for prime time. So I know the Verizon relationship with Riot, Riot using VR, and there's a partnership between, you know, Verizon, Riot, and the League, and I guess they're integrating 12 games through the League Pass subscription. What, how would you describe VR today? Is it ready for prime time for an immersive experience for a fan watching a game on League Pass? Anybody want to address that? Well, well, I will say that we do offer League Pass games currently on VR. So we are, we do have that opportunity currently um, for fans, as I yeah. mentioned, alluded to beforehand, you know, who don't have the opportunity yeah. to attend a game in person to be able to watch a game through VR. So I, I only expect yeah. that to continue to grow as the technology develops as well. Okay. Is it a fairly limited market today for that? Still fairly limited, fairly niche? I mean, it's certainly Even growing. Headsets to I mean, yeah. it's certainly growing. I think maybe Michael could speak more to, you know, just the overall adoption of VR. But I think as more homes and households start um, having VR headsets as common as they yeah. do, uh, you know, a PlayStation or an Xbox, I think you'll only see that continue to grow. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Okay. And, um, one of our portfolio companies um, that's probably well known to, to Jacob and others is, is a company called Little Star. Um, and, and so they're doing a lot in the VR space, particularly around live entertainment. Um, gaming, professional sports, et cetera. We see that space growing uh, exponentially. Uh, we really do. And, and I know it's interesting, everyone talks about VR kind of being a thing of three or four years ago and it's past us. I think this is kind of that second generation of VR and, yeah. and what it means. Um, you talk about Jacob QR codes, right? And it's making a, a furious comeback. Uh, you can't go to a restaurant without basically finding the menu on it. You can't get information without it these days. Um, you know, these are things that, that I think we left for dead. Um, and then, so in many respects, we're just finding new ways to, to utilize this in, in applications. And that's what excites me the most is that um, it, as long as there's an engaged audience and you have relevant technology, um, so much of it is just time. Um, and, 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 you know, for a lot of the entrepreneurs who have joined us today, I, I mean, yeah. good and bad, right? It's, yeah. you can have the greatest idea in the world and, and it's just the wrong, wrong place, wrong time. Yeah, this is classic of Ara's law and the Gartner hype cycle, right? And, and the trial of disillusionment. And at some point, you, you find an application and it works. So, all right. So let, let's talk about now sports tech and let's talk about some really advanced. So one of the, one of the many very interesting um, uh, entities underneath the Satarja Center is their blockchain accelerator. And, you know, I guess I want to start off by looking at this relationship between the Sacramento Kings and the league, right? The Kings, of course, are a pioneer in the use of accepting cryptocurrency, just as one small example. 
We've seen this relationship with Dapper and this NBA Top Shop, which is you know, yet another example of the adoption of blockchain. So it looks like you know, this is in, we certainly saw it with FC Barcelona, their cryptocurrency as a way to create a little bit more engagement with their fan base. And, and that thing took off like a rocket ship. So what can we, what can we say about blockchain and crypto as, as it comes into professional sports in general and the NBA in particular? Why don't we start off with the Kings relationship? Maybe that Michael uh, or um, or or um, uh, Jacob. Obviously, this is an example where there's a there's a great relationship league and the teams. So, how does that back and forth work? You've got a Tibco. So he comes out of a tech background and you've got an ownership group that's very much an industry, uh, you know, savvy group. How does that discussion start? Do they typically bring their desires to you when it comes to that and then the, the league helps them implement it? Well, I think that, that goes back more to, you know, uh, the discussion of things going both ways and, you know, the league working in partnership with the team um, on activations they're looking to, to execute. But, I'm by no means, you know, a cryptocurrency expert, so I'll leave that to someone else. But I think the larger story here is that you could kind of expect more teams and vendors and partners to create these geo, you know, specific programs um, that are endemic to like the region that they're in. So blockchain is almost synonymous with, you know, Silicon Valley, and so it makes sense that you have that partnership with the Sacramento Kings. And I think, you know, if, if, you know, we've seen at least. With uh, Nike, Nike, I think is a great example of introducing their city yeah. edition jersey about three years ago. And yeah. what they do is yeah. the city edition theme is to draw fans closer to the teams, right? By taking specific features from the team's locale, whether it be architecture, music, uh, landmarks, yeah. mottos, and create that connection and ties back with the fan, right? So, for example, yeah. the, the New York, the the Brooklyn Nets, they had the Kuji pattern that is synonymous with Biggie on their city edition. Uh, uniform. So I think what you see is that more brands are starting to create these geo-specific programs and personalizing and making that connection with a fan um, on a really specific um, and engaging attribute that's not just personalizing just to what the fan wants, but where the fan lives. I think that's maybe like the larger story here that we can pay attention to. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, <laughs> again, very timely news, right? I mean, we scheduled this this webinar and this session uh, it, with perfect timing, and today, uh, you know, you probably saw the news about CryptoKitties. Uh, Andre Iguodala and Dinwiddie uh, investing, yeah. you know, in their $12 million round. Uh, it just, again, shows you that not only are NBA players um, tech savvy, but they're also kind of on the forefront of where things are moving in, in various things. And, and, you know, I know Jacob knows the company, obviously, collectibles, um, what's going on there. Um, it, it, it's an exciting time, just broadly. Um, you're starting to see more and more players um, become investors. I mean, it, it, you could argue the VC, and yeah. this is cliche to say, right, is the new yeah. steakhouse um, for, for athletes. Um, they, 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 they see the technology uh, on the court. They, they, they train with it. They recover with it. Well, why wouldn't you want to embody yourself with it? Um, and it's not just, you know, tech, right? I mean, Steph Curry today, you saw the news probably about the, uh, the recovery drink. Um, that he's now going to be endorsing. Yeah. And so I think you're seeing these brands continue to find value. Um, I mean, when the late Kobe Bryant invested in body armor, I think he put $6 million in at like a $10 million valuation. And, you know, four years later, Coke uh, unloads $300 million into the company and, and Kobe's shares are worth something like $200 million. Um, so you're seeing success. Um, and I think it's really easy to want to emulate that and follow it. That's interesting. And I've got to believe having these extraordinarily insightful people that, that you know eat, breathe, and sleep these products, right? They make great advisors or great people around the company to, to kind of move you forward. Not even talking about the endorsement value and the brand recognition, but just the insights they bring. So there's a private question that came in, and this is also around blockchain. How is blockchain being used either for ticket or memorabilia authentication? to prevent any kind of fraud. Is, is there any project underway right now that is uh, addressing this? 
Anybody familiar with anything on this front? No. We have, we have a separate license. All right, then let's let's specifically move focused on. on so, it, Mike, let's continue with you. Can you talk to me? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jacob. Please. All right. You can continue. Just, just uh, I, I would tell whoever that was who wrote the question just to Google um, Live Nation acquisition of Upgraded. Um, this was a company a couple of years ago that is utilizing blockchain technology um, to follow, obviously, the, the path of the ticket. Um, the, the guy who runs the company, Sandy, is brilliant. Um, he's in the Bay Area, most, one of the most thoughtful entrepreneurs you'll ever meet. So uh, definitely get in touch with him. Great. Jacob, did you want to add to that or we good? No? Okay. So let's let's talk more about sports technology now because the, Michael, I know you wrote a very, very interesting article that appeared in TechCrunch where you looked at the landscape of you know investments in sports tech. And a significant amount of that, of course, was going toward fan engagement, right? So as you look at the landscape, right, and you look at some of the things that the league has done, but what are some of the things that you're most excited about? Are there two or three sports yeah. tech companies that are coming along that really indicate where the future will be? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the article you referenced, I think that the date on that one was October 1st of, of last year. So um, you could pretty much disregard everything I wrote in it. Um, yeah. Everything has changed. Um, there are some some consistent trends, though, I think you're, you're going to continue yeah. to see. Um, so going into the space itself, the things that they get me personally excited and some of the stuff that I'm seeing in, in the fan engagement space, um, we, we classify um, gambling, legalized gambling, uh, betting in, in, in fan engagement because we think it plays a, a pretty prominent role. Um, you know, a lot of things right now, you, you're seeing just the emergence of every SPAC under the sun. You're going to see more of these. You see um, uh, Tillman uh, in, in Houston with, with Lancadia taking the Golden Nugget public uh, through a SPAC. Um, so you have MGM, you have DraftKings. Uh, people will bet. Um, there's no question about it. And when, when, when sports goes away, they, apparently they just all go to Robin Hood, but uh, they'll come back. Um, and so ultimately, uh, that's a space that we're continuing to monitor and, and watch. There's a company, a uh, very early stage out of the Philadelphia area called Abe Bets. So it aggregates various lines, um, things that are kind of early or more or less in their infancy. Um, again, really engaging space. And then the last thing I'd say on the betting side is you look at every single state in this country who is going to be bleeding red for the next God knows how many years, given all the challenges right now fiscally. Yeah. I hate to say it, but they're going to start turning to legalized gambling as a revenue stream and a very viable one to help yeah. get them out of a very massive deficit in some cases. So yeah. I think you're going to see the legalization pick up uh, significantly in the next 12 months as well. Okay. Um, the other real space real quick, Mike, and I'll turn it over to the other panelists um, that, that we're really excited about is any technology that essentially connects that proxy audience to the in-venue experience or brings brands into the equation on a more kind of uh, thoughtful, relevant level. Um, you know, so I know we had talked about a company before called 4D Site, um, yeah. you know, based in the, in, in the Berkeley area and, and what they've done um, with the program itself and, and, and what they're continuing to do in the esports space. Um, you know, it, to me, that is a great um, kind of microcosm of, of the types of technology that we're going to continue to see. Um, yeah. and, and so, um, you know, again, early innings, but at the same time, very exciting. Yeah. And 4D site, by the way, is uh, a, a team that is currently matriculating in the Berkeley Skydeck Accelerator. Mm -hmm. And Irhan, who is uh, back in Turkey, given what's going on right now, is uh, getting some incredible traction. And this is all about the placement of advertising in esports, in video, in you know highlight reels, etc. And uh, it's it's been an amazing thing to see how quickly they're getting out of the gate. Absolutely, Jacob and Brendan, what what uh, what's your crystal ball telling you guys? What are you seeing that's exciting right now? I would say, and this kind of piggybacks a little bit on what Mike was talking about, but I, I think we're very very focused on investing all of our time and efforts around creating the right infrastructure to be direct to consumer. Yeah. And, and, and I think, and I think that, you know, digital is pointing in that direction more than anything. I mean, and, yeah. and this idea of, of providing more personalized experience, whether it's someone who was interested in, in gambling on the game or someone who wants to buy the sneakers that Steph Curry's wearing and being able to do it in real time while they're watching the game. 
And so I think you're going to see over the next, you know, five years or so is these companies, it's, it's the ability to embed that yeah. type of you know, commercial experience inside the, inside the, the content is going to be a game changer for just how people consume. And I think, and I think the other thing I see, and we see it most in esports, is our fans want a voice in that process. You know, uh, you know in a voice right. and innovation and how what they're experiencing. So, you know, what we we have our Twitch broadcast, the Twitch chats going on, and we're getting real time ideas of what they want to see, and you know, it, it literally leads to our broadcast meeting during the week. And we're not waiting year to year to make adjustments. We're making yeah. them week to week. And right. fans will literally freak out if they see something they asked for the week before yeah. embedded in the next broadcast. And you, by the way, you give them credit for it, even yeah. down to a, 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 a personal level. It, it creates an unbelievable yeah. amount of engagement. Awesome. I love it. Jacob? Yeah, I mean, Brandon hit it, you know, the nail on the head in terms of our focus on, on D2C and direct-to-consumer. And I think one of the big things that we look for, you know, when, when talking to vendors and trying to integrate their technology is to make sure um, that the innovation that they're bringing and the technology that they're bringing can change and is fungible with what we're producing. Because the climate, as we know, it's constantly changing. So we need to make sure that, you know, the technology that's being embedded can be changing for the fan and can be changing as an organization internally. So... Um, we're definitely going through that process now and we're in the early stages, but it's absolutely a uh, focus, the DTC focus for us in the future. All right. And, you know, it, again, with so much investment in esports and e-gaming, you know, even though the league, of course, has 2K and you've got so many other partnerships, but yet at the, at the team level, you've got, whether it be Misfits Gaming, working with the Magic and the Heat, or you've got, you know, other entities working with the Celtics and the Raptors, right? So they're making their own decisions, their own investments. And Brendan, use the phrase lean in, that you want to lean into that, that it's kind of this open innovation for everyone. So, you know, it's, it's a remarkable thing to see how much innovation is flowing in through the league and then through the franchises. Um, and, and what role do you guys think you need to play, if at all, in facilitating all of that? Or is it, is it just kind of you know, Darwinian and let the, let the best esports team win, what, regardless of where that might happen. Well, and, and, and we learned this firsthand from our Team Bow experience. There's always going to be yeah. a team or two that goes first. And, 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 yeah. it, and it's actually great for the entire league because, you, know, we, we, you know, we learn from that. And you mentioned yeah. the Magic and Heat. Listen, the Magic and Heat yeah. are leveraging a really sophisticated and strong sales mechanism and marketing talent. And, yeah. you know, and they're helping misfits kind of, you know, uh, with their business operations. And so it makes total sense. And I think, isn't, I will yeah. say that it goes both ways because certainly we've been running a, a league for 70 plus years. So there's plenty we know in terms of league infrastructure and things of that nature, but yeah. we're learning a ton from the world of esports. And, and I am watching what Overwatch League and what League of Legends are yeah. doing j just as much as I'm watching anything else. Wow. And I see, I love that. I love that here's a, a league at the top of its game. And to your point, you were willing to bet on collaboration with between the teams and that has paid off and you're willing to benchmark, you know, outside of your own league. So no question you're learning from esports, but what are some of the other companies that you're all looking at as sort of benchmarks where you're getting some insights that are, you know, either inspirational or, or teaching you things that you may not have considered before? as you become more and more of an entertainment franchise. Yeah, at least, I, in, sorry, you go ahead. Now I was gonna say, you know, I, I think the beauty of innovation is the fact that it, it can be found anywhere and it isn't just restricted by, you know, a league or sports league. So are we certainly, you know, and given my role, I'm, I'm certainly paying attention to what's going on in other leagues and teams and yeah. staying very close to what's trending. We could definitely look for inspiration and innovation in other places. And, you know, an example that quickly comes to mind is, you know, what Amazon did with, with their lockers. And we saw that and we said, hey, why yeah. aren't we or how could we, you know, use elements of that in our business? So, you know, during the last All-Star game, we actually had, you know, our version of lockers set up where fans can purchase, you know, All-Star merchandise through the app, our NBA app, and pick them up in lockers to save time 
you know, um, hacking out in retail. So I think inspiration and, and innovation can come from everywhere. And I think part of what makes the NBA so great and innovative is that we're not restricting ourselves to, to boundaries of just sports, but it spans across all industries and all different um, brands and, and what like. So um, I think as long as, you know, as everyone here continues to realize that innovation is limitless and, you know, there are opportunities that are, yeah. are everywhere, um, I think that's a strong lesson to be taken. That's great. And no one, yeah. Oh, please, yeah, Eklak, I want to, you know, make sure we're, we're keeping within our time commitments here. Yeah, yeah, no, but I actually wanted to, um, to kind of jump in with a question, if I could, and, and, uh, um, and maybe I just narrate a little bit of what I'm hearing. So first of all, um, it, it's, it's been like, really, like, eye-opening, like, like great discussion. I got some points out of it, you know, like definitely uh, I see the N NBA as being, you know, very innovative. I love that you've been using open innovation that, you know, connecting between different teams or like picking up from, from different parts of the world in terms of what you're doing. Uh, I got this message that COVID um, has been an accelerator. I think, um, I, I think I'm hearing that across different industries. Um, whatever was weak, COVID is really hurting it. And whatever, um, whoever is in a position to adapt or be strong, it's really pushing them. And, and so like, I'm getting that, that message also here. Um, I like your points about people on the ground are helping to know the trends, the, the whole global discussion, um, very helpful. Um, uh, also this interconnection between the virtual world and the real world and how you can use so much data um, in like this transition that's going on. I wanted to see if I could wrap all of that back and see if you could answer um, or help me think about, uh, given all of this, what do you look for? How could a um, academic institution um, uh, either engage or what would you look for from an academic institution to support the type of things that you're now doing, the, the companies that you see going ahead, you know, where do academic institutions play a role? That, that would be my like, um, like big takeaway that I'd like to get out of it. Yeah, I, it's, it's a great point. I guess what I would say from an academic perspective that I think is still a missing piece is I think the world of marketing is changing dramatically in terms and the use of data as and, and to be nimble and to be as quick and, and to be quick to change. I think um, it's making potentially your marketing more specific and more segmented, but I think trying to figure out the premium that comes along with that, because I, I think, you know, we have an audience, for example, that uh, is, is significantly harder to reach through traditional channels. They're consuming content in a way that the world hasn't figured out yet and marketing hasn't figured out yet. So as a result, I think we end up with a premium audience. And, and, and then and what is, what's the value of personalization? So if I can feed you exactly what you're asking for in, a, in real time, what's the value of that? Do I all of a sudden, get, am I all of a sudden getting $48 per consumer versus $1.50? And, and I think that's the, that's the part I think is, you know, it, it'll, it'll make me change the way in which I market my product and maybe what I pursue. Okay, uh, just on that point, and I don't wanna go too tactical here because we're, we're really listening, but we would love to have a follow-up conversation with you because you may know that we teach, you know, a very large course called Data X, and we have yeah. data, AI, machine learning skills like 200 students at a time. You know, some of these projects relating to what you can know about uh, personalization or data, uh, we can have teams of students actually working on those things. So like not to figure it out now, but maybe that's a possible next step engagement. That's great. Yeah. Uh, any I other ideas? You from your perspective. Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, I, I think academia plays a, a, a massive role and I think it, it boils down to something quite simple and, and it's problem solving. I mean, that's what startups are doing and, and they're addressing pain points and scalable problems. And, you know, I think the other thing as it relates to this conversation in the NBA is in many cases the, the individuals going through these institutions are right in the sweet spot of the NBA demo, which is substantially younger 
um, uh, and, and always looking for the next big thing, right? So I think tapping into that avidity um, and understanding kind of what they're passionate about is what ultimately is going to help brands like the NBA uh, continue to, to learn and evolve. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, the big thing for me is just, and maybe this is just kind of side point, right, around COVID and, and therapeutics and vaccines and all those things. But, uh, you know, a, a lot has been in the news these days about Moderna, right, and that they're taking much more of an AI type of an approach to science. And I think yeah. it, it's very consistent with what you're seeing. Um, you can say AI of diagnosing injuries and AI of diagnosing this and that from a sports tech perspective. But to Brendan's point, I wonder when you can start layering AI into fans and insights and almost kind of predicting what they're, how they're going to react, when they're going to react and what they're going to look for next. Right. And yeah. I know that seems like, you know, really deep tech machine learning type of stuff. That's the type of stuff that we're really excited about as, as we think about kind of the next fund um, of investing. Okay, so that's great. You know, you kind of brought up two ideas there, two topics. One is um, just understanding what this younger demographic wants out of sports. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on that category, I could imagine a sports lab where the, the challenge is you know, what would make sports ideal for you or like in your consumption pattern or something. So a lot of it is basically the creativity of in your lifestyle and how do you fit with it. And then you could go into prototyping those kind of solutions for, for that demographic. And then of course, the, the second topic, which goes along with what Brendan was saying, was um, you can definitely analyze this data and make all kinds of automated decisions and automatically set prices. I mean, there, there's a lot of things you can do there uh, just on the quantitative side. Okay, all right, very good. Mike, I, I think I'm handing it back to you, but that, you know, that's like, we love these conversations because it takes us into these spaces that, you know, we're not thinking about every day, but, you know, but we're trying to build a, um, an innovation center and, and a way to engage the rest of the world that's meaningful. So, you know, I'm just you know, like, regardless of what you say from here, I do want to just appreciate um, the insight and the conversation that you're, you're bringing into our circle. Yeah, and, and I want to echo that, Iklok. I mean, I don't think we could have had three better panelists who each bring their own unique but complementary perspective. And they're all reinventing the future, right? They are reinventing the future of professional sports. They're doing it, you know, through both technology and through passion. And I think both of those things need to come together. And so, you know, to, to and again, as a fan, as an NBA fan, since I was a little boy, um, but also as an innovation aficionado, you know, I can't help but marvel at watching the NBA continue to kind of set the pace for professional sports. It's, it's a remarkable thing. And it's especially remarkable today when with all of the negative news we see, I'm able to go and turn on a game at night and I'm able to watch, you know, Kobe go up against uh, Kawhi and, and, and all is good in my world for at least a couple of hours. So thank you to the NBA for bringing some normalcy into our lives. Um, keep doing hey, hey, Mike, 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 don't, don't forget uh, 2K League's on Twitch tonight, too. Don't forget. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> yeah, I'm small school, brother. Small school. You gotta, you can, you gotta keep this on the tricks, but yes, okay, let's not forget the other piece of that. Exactly. And at some point, you're gonna have a real, not like the American World Series in baseball, where it's a bunch of uh, U.S. teams playing, you're gonna have a real World Series of, you know, Asia and Latin America and Europe and the North Americans going at it for, for the real world series of 2k can't wait till that happens so e clock i think with that i'm gonna i'm gonna wind down and if there's anything any last things you want to say but i just want to thank jacob fine and brendan Donahue from the nba and michael proman from uh, scrum ventures and sports tech tokyo i know you're all very busy and i know that you know you guys are in the middle of a season right now um and so the fact that you were able to share your time so so uh, thoughtfully with us and michael Really can't thank you enough. Really enjoyed our discussion. Learned a lot and look forward to following up with all of you. Eklok, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.
Okay, I guess we're done, guys. All right.